Uh, thanks, Leander, for introducing me. Um, my name is Nishan Saldana, and uh, I'm here, of course, to talk about my research and uh, my research and my thought process um, for the work in the show. Uh, here is a, an overall picture of the painting that I made that exists in the show, and it's titled uh, "The Ghosts in the Archives." And I think because I'm an artist, it it's very it's harder for me to find a way to explain my method of research because it uh, it kind of goes in and out of maybe what research looks like traditionally and how you can even show it because so much of it is actually in your mind and that actually connects to uh, and the mind being a filter for something that has to come out and the shapes that are inside don't actually match what comes out onto the uh, final image. So I'm going to try and actually show you my process instead and then explain maybe how the thinking happened through it. Um, maybe we could I'd actually like to start by reading a small, uh, while we have this slide, uh, the small reflection that I wrote uh, that I feel helps actually position the work a bit. Um, no human archive will matter when the last human being goes. Every archive is a haunting. To wander into an archive is to bring out ghosts and enter into a spectral game of hide and seek. We are archives. We carry with us the ghosts of all things, people, places, incidents, events, good and bad news, insects, fruits, trees and fictions. These ghosts waltz around us and waltz us, moving, here, moving us here and there with unknowable agendas. They trail behind us, leave in our experiences and keep returning, refusing to feign order, symmetry or tidiness they sometimes worm their way into the libraries of our mind to stay forever. I began to name my ghosts, especially the recurrent stubborn ones, even those I fear might come to be someday. If I name them, will they go away? If I arrange them in front of me, will they behave? Um, so, because we were thinking about I'd like to just show you what some of my uh, early, what I call research looks like. Sometimes when you're making a work, research just looks like sitting in front of a blank page and drawing shapes and seeing what happens. And because we're thinking about the process of archiving, I think it implies that you have to bring order to something that is actually not very orderly. And the constant tension between the organic human being without which the archive would not exist, which is to say the archivist. And the thing that you are trying to explain is really what I think is comes to the foreground in this process. So I sat with a lot of squares saying that each square will have something in it. Um, and as I kept repeating this exercise as a way to kind of forget your own uh, self in it and become less self-conscious, the squares started to change shape and started to change form. And I started to write down things also under each, uh, uh, under each um, you know, drawing that at the same time was worrying to me and uh, strange because it seemed like words that would not make sense with this idea of decolonization, though very much that is the attempt that I was trying to make. Um, for example, both, uh, one says both clear and ambiguous at the same time. And that was me trying to explain what it is that I would like to, the squares to be, and the squares that eventually turned into ghosts. And the other one says, the hot, vibrant colors of India. I think uh, I feel quite safe about that one because while there is always a warning in art against tropicalizing yourself or representing yourself as the exotic, um, the one thing that I feel is the truth about our existence is that we live in a world where color is exploding everywhere. And we live in a very hot, environment and we are the people who inhabit it. Uh, at the same time, it's really wonderful to look at Goan art generally and art made by Goan artists in the last several decades and see that it seems ra largely unconcerned with the, with the aesthetics and the agendas of contemporary Indian art. And there's even a wonderful essay that came out, which was very important for me some time ago called um, the Invisible River of Konkani Surrealism, 
which explained actually why Goan art is both ignored by Indian mainstream as well as why it doesn't seem to be too worried about that as well. Um, so it went from that to drawing ghosts on my daily lists. My daily lists include uh, things like send images to Leandra and also <laughs> breathe somewhere there as well as uh, fail, it's okay. Um, and at, this is when the characters started to come in. Uh, and again, it was a very personal process of thinking, what are these ghosts? For me, I'm really drawn to the motif of grapes in Goan art. And I felt like I had to draw a ghost of grapes, for example. Uh, and again, the act of like trying to become unselfconscious and just make something is just quick repetition. So. I had a notebook, I had several actually, where I just drew ghosts. In the beginning, the ghosts just looked the same. They all looked like triangle with little legs. And soon they started to change uh, shape. Um, after that came uh, uh, actually a more, this is where I felt like the inner mining of the archive started to really show up, where I started a book called List of Ghosts to Draw. And it was weirdly like a linguistic, um, stream of consciousness, train of thought process where I went from grapes to skull to prehistoric frog to Napoleon to cochineal bugs to blood-stained hand, which says in brackets, the red dye of cochineal, because when they collect the, the dye from the cactus, um, your hand becomes red. Uh, Sousa's Time Magazine chemical print, St. Francis Xavier, the rocks at Agonda. And I know that in all of this, there are connections that go between the research, between the history of Goa, my personal experiences, my everyday thoughts, my aspirations, um, and just very mundane things as well. Uh, and so then also diary pages, I started to do this as well. Uh, friends who would send me research, conversations I had, things that I was learning about shapes. Um, next slide, please. Um, and finally, there were these squares and it felt like uh, this was really the beginning of the work and the way in which to maintain order because it's always an attempt to create order in the beginning. Uh, and to go really into historical research as well and the things that troubled me, um, I started to create a body of images. Here is a really emblematic image that we have all been talking about and it is uh, an image of the inquisitorial table of Goa in which all the hearings of the Inquisition would happen on this table. Uh, and right now it's somewhere in the state archives, but I was able to find a photograph that was in, again, thanks to another archive and the great efforts of the Sousa and Paul Photographic Company, they saw the, uh, they took an interest and documented this table and I was able to find a picture of that table. And so, yeah, and so the final work, and here's the ghost of that table, Right uh, above it is the ghost of just hearing. Um, and for me, uh, a personal important one is the ghost of Konkani um, over there above it, or rather the ghost of Romi Konkani. And uh, next slide, please. And so it's, it was a very strange process of think, having to think like, how did an object like this end up in my hands? I can give you a very clear explanation of saying that there was Indian Ocean trade and Africa and the importance of Africa in the colony uh, within the Portuguese framework. But the ambiguity and the number of chance encounters that would have had to happen for that object to end up in my hand in the 21st century is really something very important to think about when you think about archives, is how much of it is actually uncontrolled, how much of it is um, chance, is randomness, and it's just not to say that these are two separate things, but it's precisely to say that these are two things that go together always, all the time. So for me, uh, when I look at archives, I try to think about being agentic as well as ambivalent at the same time, or as well as ambiguous, because I think every reading of an archive, however expert you might be, or however expert you might not be, is also an ambiguous reading, because there are about 25 other readings um, of the same one. But and these are just a few pictures, and I think my presentation is just the last one. You can go. With me. Um, I had to put in the ghost of America for myself. Um, here's that object that ended up there. Um, yeah. 
Thank you so much.